but I was like, oh, there's somebody in line. I'll just go. Oregon Ocean Science Trust regular meeting Thursday, June 1st, 2017. Yeah, that's the participant code. I'm trying to enter the host code. Yeah, do that one first. Oh, really? Okay. And then you do this. There are one participants on the call, including you. You are joining your conference at the host. For many of the very first men, the president of the We're missing Emily's. State lands. Emily Martin, trust me here. Sabrina, Department of State Lands. Shelby Walker, Marine Seaman. Uh, Andy Lear, member of the public and DLCD staff. Kat Maker, Governor's Office. Nancy Mirko. Uh, Jeff Burright, member of the public, OC student, and DLCD intern. Uh, welcome. All right. Um, I don't have any opening comments, so let's just go to the uh, meeting summary uh, from the December 1 meeting. I have one edit to that, and that's under the GNRO piece on the first page. In the second line, the Marina should be Marina. So just change that page and put it in find any. Okay, so motion to approve them as edited. So moved. Second. All second. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, draft rules. So you have in front of you the draft rules. Um, just as a reminder, we have a 60-day comment period. We hold it, held a uh, very lonely public hearing in the court. Richard and I visited for about a half hour waiting to see if anybody was going to show up, and they didn't, so we left. Um, uh, so we and we got no public comments at all uh, in any form. I do have one uh, small editorial edit, and this got messed up because I made a change to uh, address something DOJ wanted uh, addressed in uh, section 160 on the last page at the bottom. There, we need to get rid of the will in that first line. So this originally said that. That was going to do this review, and DOJ pointed out that we don't get to direct what staff does. Staff chooses what it does, so 
this is, was changed to indicate that we'll ask them to do it. Yeah. It's their choice whether they choose to do it. So, uh, and I, when I made the change, I missed getting rid of the will. So you just pull the will. Yes, and then it's fine. <laughs> Have you talked to staff about their interest in? Well, Shelby's chair of the stack, so she's been involved in this discussion all along. Right? Yeah, the stack is reconvening. Um, right. And certain, primarily a matter of memory reserves, but I think it's a body will be coming back more frequently and it seems appropriate. Okay. And other than that, I have no other changes. So, unless there's any remaining concerns, I Take a motion to formally adopt these rules. So move. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Any discussion? Questions? You apparently did a really good job. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, the rack no. helped. Yeah. So, significant clear. changes uh, from our rack process. So, all right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and Sabrina just left. So I think the plan is that these would get filed on June 15th. They would go into effect on July 1st. Sabrina, is that right? We Definitely. file these, the rules, June 15th, they'd go into effect July 1st? Yeah, anytime before June 15th. Okay. And all other notifications have happened that needed to happen back when we sent out the draft rules. And I don't know, is there a... Do the final rules go to somebody in the legislature or not? They'll go to the legislature. They'll go to Secretary of State yeah. and then the Legislative Council. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're so, yes. and if, if any number of uh, bills pass, actually, it wouldn't affect us going forward. There's a lot of rulemaking bills that I don't think. Okay. <laughs> okay. But we'll take into account whatever may pass and be uh, required at the time. Okay. So, Sabrina is the rules coordinator. You'll take care of whatever the process is from here yep. on out. And then we'll, we're out of the room. There is an edit to the very last, to 160 yes. that Richard made. So, Got it. Okay. Okay. thank you. Great. Uh, did, I, did we vote? Mm -hmm. Okay. We did. Yes, you did. And passed. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so, legislative report. So, Senate Bill 281, which is Senator Roblin and uh, Representative McCowan's uh, bill that would provide a million dollars to the Ocean Science Trust, is sitting at the the uh, black hole drawer at Ways and Means, which is where all appropriations bills go that don't have funding for them <laughs> somewhere uh, for the end of the session free for all. I would expect that if we're going to get funding, it won't come in Senate Bill 281. It'll come in the, the close of session bill, the, the Christmas tree bill at the end, and it'll just get added in as a line item in that bill if it's going to happen. So I think Senate Bill 281 won't surface anywhere at this point. Um, but uh, there's still a possibility, although I think it's fairly remote, that um, there. Uh, there might be funding in the Christmas tree bill. And that bill probably hasn't been printed yet, so we don't have a bill number. It'll have a start with a five. It'll be a 5,000 bill uh, when and if they get to it. Louise, would you like me to forward that to the Oost members when the Christmas tree bill comes yes. out? Only if yeah. you're in it? Or? Yeah, that would be good. Okay. Yeah. What's an anticipated time frame for that? So the, they're hoping to go home in early July. There's now, I've seen some press coverage about the potential that they go home without a budget <laughs> um, and come back in special session. Whether that's real or not, I don't know. But uh, there is a lot of negotiations going on. The transportation package just surfaced yesterday, a 300-page bill. Um, so that piece is now out. Uh, the revenue group is still working on some mix of tax increases. All of those require the three-fifths majority in both the Senate and the House, so you need Republicans who are going to vote for it. I don't know where all of that stands at this point. Um, and then, um, which are in the Revenue Committee, and then the Christmas tree bill will start in uh, Ways and Means, uh, when and if that's ready. And there's generally, they're already working on drafting the Christmas tree bill. Towards the end of session, 
the subset committees close down today or tomorrow? Today, June okay, 1st, right? today. So all the subsidy bills, other than rules and... Um, um, uh, re not revenue. Um, is yeah, it revenue. revenue. Yeah. Uh, shut down today and ways and means. So yeah. all the, the subsidy bills have to be out of committee today uh, to still be alive or be in rules or revenue. Um, and so there'll be some shuffling of bills to rules today <laughs> to keep them alive if they, they're not done with the amendment process for those. So from now on, the focus is really on the budget and getting the rest of the substantive bills to the floors uh, and getting conference committees set, set up if need be, if there's a different version that comes out of what else than what came out of it, the rest. So it'll be a ways and means process from now until they go home. And um, I know they were hoping to be done by late June, early July, and we'll see. It, mm -hmm. If they don't get a budget deal, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they, it, they're limited to 150 days in this session, which I think is sometime in early July. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have a budget by then, then they come back into special sessions. Mm -hmm. And there could be, this is a situation where there could be more than one special session. In 2002, there were five. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. After the legislative session, well, it, yeah, it was after the 2001 legislative session, there were five special sessions because of the budget deficit and they couldn't mm -hmm. get agreement. So, All right. so. Would there ever be um, a bit, an amount different from the million? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they could put 100,000, they could okay. put 50,000, they could put some small <coughs> amount in. Small so. change. They could put more in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, and then Senate Bill 1039, which is the one that sets up the uh, Ocean Acidification Hypoxia Task Force, of which uh, Oost would be a member, uh, is also in that infamous drawer at Ways and Means because it needs an appropriation. Uh, so what would happen, that bill actually would surface uh, and still may get passed. Uh, with or without an appropriation, the ODFW put a fiscal on it to pay for their costs of staffing that effort, um, which must have been over $50,000 because that's sort of the line between absorbing you know, it and yeah, yeah, needing absorbing it or not. And so, uh, given the size of the fiscal they would need in the Christmas tree bill or in 1039 itself, some sort of appropriation to pay those costs. Um, so we'll see where that ends up, but that bill is still alive also, uh, down at Ways and Means. And Chris, I don't know if there's anything else you know of related to oceans. Those are the two that I know of. Um, yeah, those are the two main ones. Uh, there was a bill for small-scale commercial kelp harvesting that had a oh, large fiscal. That was House Bill 3193. Um, that did not, um, that went to ways, yeah, that went to ways and means. Um, and then I think it's been withdrawn because of the fiscal that ODFMW put on it. Uh, it would essentially would have repealed DSL statutes with, re and I think it would have done something to OPRD statutes with regards to any sort of uh, involvement in seed, grass, or kelp harvesting and established a permitting program at the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, Bill passed off committee, but um, ODFNW would have to get a brand new permitting program up and running and then a, a heavy fiscal on it. So uh, this is an aside, this is an OOS related, but DSL has been in contact with um, the main proponent about it, about you know if, if there'd be an opportunity for some research on the South Coast with regards to small scale hand harvesting of kelp. So we're to come with that. Generally the ballpark. For starting a new permitting process, um, uh, I think they were at somewhere between th three and five hundred thousand for this biennium, and then with some continued um, costs going forward. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it's three five three hundred thousand this year and another five. <laughs> it was something they also would have to demonstrate that the permitting program is consistent with at least goal nineteen, and I don't know. Um, it would depend on where they're harvesting, if it, would, it might involve goal 18 too, or just goal 19. Just goal 19. Um, so that, that issue sort of has a long history mm -hmm. related to a single individual. Um, 
So DSL and statutes uh, allows them to issue authorizations for kelp removal. The land board adopted rules several years ago prohibiting it because of the current concerns about uh, impact on habitat. Um, the process that's in statute and rule is really complicated. You have to have a commercial facility and so there, it's a very difficult process to get through even if you wanted to do it uh, and you were allowed. In the meantime, an individual has been hand pulling, hand pulling from a canoe or a kayak uh, on the south coast and has been commercially processing it uh, at his home. Um, and so... Uh, for, for what product? So... For, uh, ed well, edible and seed cream. Supposedly, ever since the statute was changed, it was tweaked. Uh, he was removing a small amount under a statutory exemption a few years back. And right. he's moved to California since. But it would like to come back and uh, do some small-scale hand harvesting. So for uh, human consumption and then also some other... I guess you could argue it's still human consumption, like face Medicinal, creams or things like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Supplements, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I think we should get ahead of at some point. Right? So, so on the rise. yeah. So and the, so the rules are still in place at DSL that prohibit it, uh, and so this was an attempt to get out of the DSL prohibition and allow it and have a BMW mm -hmm. set up a separate permitting process. This gentleman has gone to individual legislators and gotten there. So. Secretary of State Richardson had a bill in back when I was the director that would have allowed um, the harvest, or I think he actually didn't have a bill and he wanted us to change the rules. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to change the rules and explain how to do the rules. It was the land board and mm -hmm. we should talk to them and he never did, so nothing ever happened. So, um, so there was a bill put in this time to move the process yeah. to the BMW. Which did pass out of committee, but did not um, move. Well, like I said, it went to Ways and Means, and, uh, and I think it's pretty, uh, it's pretty much done. With that said, he could certainly petition the land board to um, amend those rules. Uh, I think his first step would be to, to do some research, and OD, OPRD and ODF and W and DSL are open to that to show you know, the... Um, show some baseline uh, information and show that his uh, possible operation would, would not um, harm uh, ocean resources <laughs> and that we could um, go forward with some sort of rulemaking amendment. So he might come back to OPAC. This, this gentleman, uh, he was at OPAC a few years ago and kind of stated his case. They didn't take it up as a priority at that time. Um, and he might be in contact with uh, Oregon Sea Grant, might be in contact with uh, certainly the DSL and probably like the OPRD and, and ODFW. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the DSL rules allow the tribes to harvest for subsistence. I didn't bring my rules. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I think there is a provision in there that allows the tribes to. Yeah. We haven't seen a lot of demand. The, right. the bill actually raised some red flags when it was changed from. Um, it had an amendment to allow other commercial purposes, um, and then that raised some red flags with the Nature Conservancy, who serves on OPAC as well. How that might expand it to other other uses besides just human consumption. Right. Okay. Any questions? Other questions about legislative activity? Okay. Public comment. All right. Yeah. <laughs> like Karen is going to be here in time. <laughs> well, it's going to be. It's going to take her a little bit of time to get here. She's she was, she was saying like ten o'clock. Okay. So I assumed we would be going at ten o'clock still. <laughs> well, we'll hang around for. It. Okay. Um, so let's not take a break now. Um, Jim, do you want to update on the? Uh, Spreadsheet. Before, before we get too far away from uh, possible funding, do you want me to touch base a little bit with the members about the process for for spending? Oh, sure. We money. do have $5,000 in the bank. Well, 4990 because this treasurer's office is charging us 10 bucks a month. So we need to spend that money before it's depleted. <laughs> yeah, so that, as Louise just indicated, you, you 
the, you know, the statute established the Ocean Science Fund. It has now actually officially been established at the Treasury. Uh, the $5,000 you, you receive from Lincoln County has been deposited into it. The Treasury does have a $10 a month service charge. Um, so as was indicated, your current balance is $4,990. Uh, hopefully you'll have additional funding to, to put in there on top of that at some point. Uh, we've talked, as we try to provide administrative assistance for you, uh, we're sort of the connection with Treasury and your money. Uh, so we've sort of discussed the process with Treasury and then internally with our uh, uh, finance staff about how we can get you your money when you, when you need it. Uh, I think the path would be for you to take some sort of action at your meeting and, and vote on how you'd like to spend it. And then Louise can, uh, as your executive director, can provide some guidance to us about how you would like that spent. DSL would can write a check. We provide payment. Uh, the initial payment would come from the Common School Fund, from our limitation and from our, our funds that are available to us. And then DSL would do a balance transfer from the Ocean Science Fund back to the common school fund to make that whole. It's a little clunky, but it's kind of the best we have right now. If you guys end up getting a large amount of money, it's probably going to be worth a conversation with Louise as the executive director and one of your non-voting members in the legislature and DSL about uh, if that's the best mechanism to go forward and if you need, like if you get a million dollars from the general fund, uh, if we need to go back and get limitation from the legislature for you to spend that. So that ten dollar fee is that a flat mm -hmm. fee or is that a percentage? I think it's a flat fee. Okay, so if we get a million dollars, it's still ten. That's my. Understanding. I can check on it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet on that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a minimum service charge. Right? I think Just that's a, probably <laughs> what's going on right now. Would you like me to check on that? Yes, I can check on that. <laughs> I'm curious. Yes. If there's time, I'm happy to provide an update about where Sea Grant is now with our current competitive research. And okay. Kind of a, you know, one of the things that we talked about was how we ensure that we're not duplicating efforts. Okay. And so I can just give a little bit of a heads up about where we are right now and okay. how that might impact future activities. Okay. All right. That would that would be great. Just we'll do that in a couple minutes here. Okay. Uh, okay, Jim. Did you want to do the public comments first? I mean, yeah, there is none. Oh, okay. I look, no. <laughs> All right. I gave uh, them ample opportunity. <laughs> yeah, the the spreadsheet is still alive and slowly growing. I think we have uh, most of the ongoing and probably several completed projects, and we will get to this. Um, no, we don't have that. <clears throat> anyway, um, the Louise and I met with a working group uh, in early April, or late April, I mean, um, in at Portland State to and so out on the you table. Have, if you didn't yeah, get it, came in there. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, that anyone else? I'm, yeah, bring them in. Just bring them in. Sure. Thanks. That I'm hoping will become. Um, the spreadsheet and a whole lot more. And uh, I think that uh, Elise Granick at Portland State University and one of her grad students, Amy, Don't uh, ask. Amy um, is working on setting this up and, and it's basically an intent Amy to... Amy Earhart. Amy Earhart, thank you. An intent to capture not only just the the basic information that we've been trying to do with the with the spreadsheet, but to expand that expand that tremendously so that not only can we find what projects are going on or have been completed, but provide access to the data itself. And um, the intent is to, and they're working on this right now to establish a uh, a website to start putting up this information. And uh, now that I mentioned this, I don't have the paper that was. Oh, that's for you. Oh, there it is. I, I do have one too. Here's the last one. Oh, here's the last one. I don't need So the intent is to, um, to determine where the data gaps are. And that was kind of our initial intent, too, to find out what's going on out there and what what we need to do if it isn't happening in, in research or monitoring areas. 
And um, the, the idea here, though, is to make this a very, very public kind of structure through a website that will probably be modeled on one of the existing um, systems out there, and I don't think the decision has been completely made. There seemed to be a, a preference or a, Explorer a, exactly, to use yeah. the Oregon Explorer as kind of the shell or at least a model uh, for this. So um, that website development will be going on through the summer, and the, the intent is to have a uh, one-day workshop associated with State of the Coast, the next State of the Coast meeting, which is in October, yeah. I think. And, and um, oh. right. And I'm hoping that within a year or so, this spreadsheet that I've been working on, unless I hear differently from the rest of you, will get the information and that will get subsumed into this new system and we can just kind of let it go. And I think that, that an important part of, of the new system will be some sort of inherent mechanism built in to provide some updates in terms of projects that are completed, uh, where the data exists, that sort of thing. Because right now, we don't have that. So on, on the existing spreadsheet that we have, I can't tell you how many are not active research monitoring programs anymore. And I could, but that would be pretty much a full-time job for a while to, to try to figure that out. So we might be looking down the road at some requests for funding to support this from, from Boost. So curious about this framing of ecosystem services and benefits, if that's going to be, sounds like what this group is working on is framed in that way. Does that, does that make this more narrow in scope than what you were doing? No, I think it's going to be much broader in scope. Okay. And I think that they spent several days wrestling with a title for this to get this started. I think that, that probably uh, the labeling will change at, at this uh, State of the Coast workshop and, uh, and probably be a little more descriptive of what, will then, what the product will actually be. I'm just thinking about like basic monitoring of chemical and physical parameters wouldn't necessarily fall under the that, framing that of ecosystem kind of benefit. Exactly. Or, I mean, obviously, it's all right. It's yeah, all so, yeah, so the goal of this group is really to create a web based platform and then this annual forum associated okay. with the State of the Coast Conference for the researchers, scientists, and the decision makers to come together. Okay. And, the, you know, we had a lot of conversation at the meeting uh, last month about what kind of information to put on the website, whether we want raw data or we want it synthesis and analysis. And there are some decision makers, agencies, and others who want the raw data, and there are some who you know, uh, DSL is a perfect example. DSL doesn't want the raw data. It needs the analysis and the, and the synthesis, synthesis for what it's doing. So you need both kinds of information available, not one or the other. And so how to build the website so that you can get both up. And that's why Oregon Explorer is nice, because it already does that. So there are um, uh, pages where you can go to the raw data, and there are pages that have articles and peer review publications and those sorts of things that uh, analyze or synth synthesize existing data. Um, and so I think the goal is to have both of those available um, and so that regardless of what kind of decisions you're making, you've got access to the information that's available. And the goal is to have a single portal that has all of the information that we know about. Um, area offshore of Oregon um, so that folks can go and, and look there and use that. And uh, as Jim said, there are, there's now a group that's going to work through the summer to get the website designed uh, and up and running. And the goal, I think, is to have sort of the prototype by the State of the Coast Conference to mm -hmm. begin to share and get feedback on, is this hitting the mark or are we not hitting the mark? So. And I think Elise's funding for this goes through November 
I think the end yeah, of November, right. if I remember correctly. So and she's got a graduate student who's working on it um, as her project. Um, so while we're talking about um, other efforts going on, so I attended the OCZMA meeting last week. Uh, just gave them an update on our work. It turned out they were running way behind schedule and legislators were coming in for their lunch meeting. So I gave them probably about a three minute <laughs> quick review of where we've been, where we are, and what we hope to do going forward. Uh, only Senators Johnson and Roblin were in the room. I don't know. And David Brocksmith, Representative David Brocksmith. Okay. There. All right. Um, so there weren't, the whole Coastal Caucus was not there. It was a small group. But they all were there. They were there. There wasn't good attendance at the OZZMA meeting. I think there were like six or seven of the local governments, and that was it. So it was not a well attended. But anyway, they. director. So it's now at AOC, Association of Oregon Counties. So they don't really have an executive director. They have staff from AOC who's staffing them. Yeah, their chairperson is a county commissioner from Clatsop County. His yeah. first name's Scott. I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. I was there, too. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I, I, I think having AOC administer them might might help. Uh, they've had low attendance at a lot of their meetings in the last couple of years, but they've just recently um, contracted with Association of Oregon Counties to... Yeah, and I was looking at their budget stuff. It looks like they're financially, they're sort of uh, on shaky grounds, which is why I think they decided to affiliate with AOC and have them provide the staffing as opposed to trying to hire an executive director because they really don't have enough money coming in. Um, there are several local governments who are no longer contributing who are no longer paying their dues, so. Okay. And they don't have contracts anymore with, they used to have contracts with OVFW to do some work, and they don't have those anymore, and I think that's how Arno and his successor got paid for the most part. Mm -hmm. Jerry. Jerry, yeah. yeah. Anyway, going to say no. something? Okay. Um, and then uh, Manus is, coming to Oregon, I think, or somewhere in the Northwest. Is it Oregon and Washington? Are they doing a joint meeting? I can't remember. In July sometime. Yeah, July 13th. They've announced the date now? They've okay. announced the date in Newport. In Newport. I believe. Yeah. It's focused on a general outreach about what they do as an organization. So they're kind of reconnecting. And this is part of their, I think, the part of their big IUS grants. They said that they would reconnect at the beginning of this next five-year grant cycle. So that's a part of the, what they're doing right now. All right. So anyway, there's an opportunity there to coordinate with them and talk to them about our priority questions that we've identified so that as they're thinking about their next five years, that hopefully they can um, help. So we're, you know, trying to sort of attend the meetings where we can, where we think there's a connection with what we're doing, and uh, we can get some things done, even though we don't have the resources to do them ourselves. And we'll continue to plug into those uh, opportunities as they come up. It's at the community college. Ah, okay. <coughs> in in Newport. Newport. Yeah. Okay. So, Louise, is that, do, you, do you anticipate attending or any of the other OOST members? I do anticipate attending. Okay. I was wondering how many might attend. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Before. That's a Thursday? Yeah. Yes, it is. I certainly could. Yeah. If I'm not on jury. Yeah. <laughs> I know that deal. Yeah, it's a possibility. Maybe if there was a time that we could set aside to meet up, you know, so have a direct line of conversation. Be available to okay. attend that as well. Okay. No, I just want to make sure if, if more than two of you attend, you don't discuss oost business unless you want to have some sort of meeting associated with it. Right. That's so that's all. actually one of my next questions is how many people can get together before it becomes an oost meeting? So only two? Yeah, three is a quorum. Three is a quorum. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys so can like sit we, there. <laughs> yeah. 
Attend and we can all attend, just, just don't can't. talk about so who's private citizens. Well, yes. can you, um, <laughs> what does it take for it to become a meeting? Uh, I mean, we would need to deal. post it. Well, yeah, it takes yeah, meeting minutes. That's so. all. Yeah. I mean, so, but it's yeah. so it's not going to be a new meeting, and I'm not too worried about if three of us attended this meeting. So, if we wanted to have a meeting with Nanus, sort of separate from the Nanus, then that would be. Then we'd have to post and mm -hmm. do all of that. So. so you sort of see it as an information and gathering and sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's you know it's their meeting and it's their opportunity to I think talk about who they are and what they're doing and yeah. get feedback from folks about Please. what they should be doing. I do sit on the governing board of, of NANA, so if you do want to have a meeting with them, okay. I'd be happy to reach out. Okay. That's good that we may at some point never have funding. You got four thousand nine hundred and ninety dollars. <laughs> yeah, that's a new month, so we probably have four thousand nine hundred and eighty today. <laughs> okay, Shelby, you wanna talk about your sure. Um well if we can pull it up and see what it went to me. Yeah. That might be a, a good way to show people what's going on. We can do that. Like now, we have time. Yes, we do. great. Um, I'm good at research and current research. Uh, so, briefly, this year is our big year for our competitive research projects. Uh, we issued our RFP back in December, and this year we're off, we're running two separate competitions. Uh, one of which is already closed. And that's the first thing that you see up here, which is the seed projects. Uh, so a little bit about that. This is a, a new thing for us. Uh, the seed projects are small scale 50K uh, projects that are nine months in duration and intended to really kind of lay the foundation for much larger scale efforts. Uh, so we funded four here. And while not everything that we, we support really aligns with where the trust is going, there are some things that I can do. Uh, so it's, it's certainly worth mentioning. Um, one is focusing on gooseneck barnacles. Uh, one is really more um, hazards related. Actually, two of them are. Uh, and then the third is really focusing on kind of that uh, valuation of deep sea habitat. Uh, so these uh, these two guys are in the midst of these projects now, and they will then be set up to compete for uh, larger dollar, longer time frame projects. So potentially about 250k per year for about three and a half years. Uh, we'll only be supporting one, possibly two, if we still exist. Right. Um, <laughs> moving forward and so that competition will be next year uh, so it will be one of those four okay. moving forward the second process that we're right in the middle of now is our normal biennial process and that is uh, our, our standard competition it's smaller this year because we are directing resources to the, the uh, seed leaf projects um, but that is, uh, we went through a pre-proposal process and we're, um, we've just received all the full proposals and we will be going through our evaluation of that. We anticipate between five and six of them. So this year, we have actually focused our RFPs a little bit more. In the past, it's been kind of open <laughs> and generic and anything associated with like healthy coastal ecosystems, give it to us. Uh, which I found kind of irritating. So uh, we have focused our efforts. I don't know if we've got the RFP available up there. Um, let me scroll down. Well, it wouldn't be on that page. Never mind. Um, but essentially what we did is this relates to our larger term strategic planning process. Uh, so we basically gave these four fairly general priorities, still general, but better than what they were, um, for people to apply towards. 
And so that's what they will be assess, assessed against for these larger scale projects. So what I envision for the future is uh, as, we, um, as we develop our RFPs, um, because we will be running the biennial in another two years, year or two, um, having a conversation with the trust about where you see yourselves going and where we're headed so that um, if we're in, even if we're somewhat aligning um, with our research efforts, we're, trying, we're, we're avoiding the duplication of that effort. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other things that I just wanted to point out here. Um, the program development projects actually here. Um, these are small scale projects between you know, like five and 30K. Uh, and they're really exploratory in nature, uh, but they do lay the foundation for larger scale efforts. So I would anticipate that things that might be supported here could, in theory, launch into something much bigger that could come to the trust. Um, when we think about, you know, we're supporting one right now on Hake. So can you, can you zoom? Yeah, and, I'm, and, I'm like, I'm maybe one of the younger people here, and I could not read that. Control <laughs> um, and scroll up should zoom. Scroll up on your mouse. Sorry. Great. Thank you. Is that good? Yeah. And I think it was just me. <laughs> I thought diet was dirt. So <laughs> 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 okay. So these are the, these are the ones that we're funding right now. Uh, they're um, fairly diverse. We don't have as much of a restriction on the topics. It's essentially things that are exploratory in nature, uh, high risk, high reward. The things where you just kind of need a little bit of data to move things forward. Um, or in our grant language, uh, things that we could not and have anticipated funding at the time we wrote our large grant to NOAA. Um, so again, these are small scale, usually um, a year or less in duration. Um, but again, these are the things that may start, may trigger uh, larger scale projects in the future. Uh, so that's generally uh, it. We post all of our research, our supported research projects here. Um, you know, as we uh, move through the evaluation process with the biennial competition, we'll be able to release that information once that com that's complete, uh, and then we'll have our uh, our large scale leaf competition from the seed projects um, <laughs> uh, next year. Okay. So these are all. Your small scale, even the internal resilience, I don't think you know. So, uh, the, so the program development projects are the, the small scale ones. The mm -hmm. internal resilience projects, if you want to scroll down, uh, that was, um, we just had a little bit of money, and so we kind of threw it into a competition. Mm -hmm. um, these, uh, the Sea Grant Omnibus grant funded projects, 2016, 2018, those are the ones that are underway right now. And so those ones, going back to kind of your two main buckets, you had the seed and then your classic seed grant funded yes. ones that you wanted to direct more than you had in the past. Is that what those are? Or what, what was your so, focus then? Yeah, this is the, uh, <laughs> these are the results from the last biennial competition. Okay. So they are in the process of, of basically wrapping them up this year. Okay. Although I would say that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that they'll all need a another no cost extension. An extension. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is what we have. We have a pretty good list of this mm -hmm. um, because we weren't doing this other competition. So I think we supported eight okay. this time. Uh, next time it'll be fewer. And the next time, so you're saying next time will be more focused. This is like the more traditional. The competition that is yeah. underway right now okay. is more focused. And what's the framing of that? Did you Let me see if we can pull up the RFP. Okay. Just kind of curious, the basic. We go to answer grant opportunities. And then. <coughs> um, scroll down. Uh, yes. 
just click on that one. And then scroll. Yeah, you might have to go in a couple pages. Okay, here. So these are our research ob objectives for the 2018-2020 competitive projects. So these are the same research objectives that we have for the season league projects. Uh, coast basically, coastal hazards, um, and then kind of market, non-market aspects of coastal ocean resources, um, kind of looking at more of the social, cultural, and political dimensions of uh, critical coastal issues. Again, the, if you can believe it, these actually are more focused. <laughs> and then uh, looking at um, the ecological, socioeconomic resilience and sustainability of Pacific Northwest coastal marine species or habitats. This is probably the one that would have the most connection mm -hmm. to this group. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've got right now. Mm -hmm. Chances oh. are good that these will change for the next biennial competition. Mm -hmm. okay. But again, that's something where we can, you know, at least have a general conversation about where we're headed. We can't really give, it'll be not a definitive conversation <coughs> just because we can't provide any advance notice of what goes out in the RFP. Right. Um, but it would be good to at least talk about where there are areas of synergy. Okay. Sure. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And are there usually some, are any of these projects reported out on at the state of the coast? Depends on where they are in the process. Okay. Uh, we may see some of that with the 2016, 2018, uh, usually from the students who are involved. Yeah. Uh, because we try to uh, have a lot of student presence there, mm -hmm. and so that might be part of their poster presentations or similar. Thank you. I have a yeah. clarifying question. Yeah. Um, do you ask for leverage grants or um, matching grants associated with these with this program? We do ask for a match, okay. and we've actually gotten a little, or we're going to get a little bit more restrictive on that. In the past, it's been not as you absolutely must have <coughs> match. Right. But we're moving towards that, and it'll be a fifty percent match that we're required to have as part of our NOAA grant. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if one of the science trips might conceivably be used as match in the future, and whether or not that um, coincidence would be allowed. Anything that is non-federal yeah. in nature can be used as match. So it's conceivable that, that these yeah. things may intersect in the future. Or Absolutely. Like the grant funding total for this biennium that you have to give out? Um, so the the biennial, it's probably uh, I never have a full number on my off the top of my head, but if you do the math, it's say five projects at 115k per year for two years. So 230 times five. Any other questions? And your seed projects are, did you say five to 30,000? They're each 50K. Oh, they're 50K. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's just a short, a nine month? Yes. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely our exploratory RFP process. I'm really, really interested to see how, how it all turns out. <laughs> um, but one of the things that uh, has been a challenge for us is uh, a two-year project with a small amount of money doesn't have mm -hmm. the same appeal. You know, even though we are providing 115k per year when you factor in overhead, it's really just not that much money. Right. And so this was an opportunity to make uh, the Sea Grant process a little bit more compelling for PIs, and but give us enough. Um, kind of access to them so that it's still the same type of project where it is um, it has kind of a media societal relevance, it incorporates outreach and engagement, it has kind of all of the classic C grant pieces, which is why we've got the C portion. Yeah. Great. 
Shelby? Sure. Okay, we're going to go back to public comment. Gina. Nine <laughs> thirty. I'll totally do it. Uh, fast here. Well, I know. I'm going to zippy quick. Oh, so I just um, so for the record, Gina Carter, Nature Conservancy. Um, I just wanted to call in, uh, or call. I'm going to come and say that um, the Nature Conservancy is interested in sponsoring exchange between the California Ocean Science Trust and the Oregon Ocean Science Trust. <clears throat> I've been in a lot of discussions with the California Science Trust, and <clears throat> they're eager to have you all as a strong partner and colleague. Um, they're interested in potentially moving on and having some joint proposals between the two science trusts. But before moving into that kind of phase, there needs to be you know, getting to know each other phase and how we operate. And they operate very differently. Um, like one of the things that they do, and Emily knows this well, I'm sure from her time in California, but they um, you know, convene the heads of agencies and the head of universities and, and identify a management problem. And then from that, we'll wrestle with like, what are the specific science questions that could be answered and they'll go out for, for, for um, funding for that. And the foundations are, are, I think, used to that kind of model. And um, some of the, sometimes I get feedback that ours seems very general, and I need it to be more specific to kind of start grasping how it fits in. And so I think um, having an exchange and getting to know each other, maybe finding where those joint opportunities are for a proposal could unlock some opportunities and maybe some, maybe long-term some funding, but if nothing else, with some ideas and, and uh, expand our boundaries of partnership. So anyhow, we have funding for that. We can um, pay for everyone on the group to go within whatever the rules are. I don't know if that, I don't know if you're allowed to travel together if it constitutes a quorum if you're on the same plane. <laughs> um, but, Everyone just listen to the, their watch yeah. a movie or something. <laughs> and we can, um, and then I also, uh, depending on what the elected officials want to do, if they want to pay on their own or have us go through ethics, uh, we can do whatever works best for you all. Um, but happy to help create this exchange or happy just to connect you all um, however you want to go about it. And we can take this conversation offline. I just want to get on the record that we were offering this opportunity if you're interested in taking advantage of it. Yeah, I think we are, you know, based on the feedback I got from the attempt to do it. Yeah. The week before yeah. last, and it turned out it was a good time not to do it because that was the day I got called in for jury duty. So oh, yeah. it would have been bad had I <laughs> had a plane ticket to go to California. Um, so, I, so there is interest from everybody on uh, the trust to do such a thing. Chris, is there an out-of-state travel restriction at the moment? Do I remember? Yes, for state employees. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. So, what? <laughs> For state employees, mm -hmm. so does that extend to us? We're not state employees. You're not, and I can go back and ask. Okay. You won't be also. You won't if they if you submit your reimbursement to the Nature Conservancy. You might be sidestepping us. Okay. In its entirety. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> so we can work out the details. Okay. Yeah, and the yeah, I just want to make sure we're not. Let's frame those questions off. I have a, breaking another the question asked fiscal anyway. <laughs> or breaking the governors. You're not, but you're not state employees. Right. So. Is there a season you're thinking, there like a time frame you're thinking? No, so any time in the next kind of six <laughs> months. I know that California is interested in doing it. They're like, let's do it in July or let's do it. Um, but I think whenever, I think it's more important that we have some good objectives and a good agenda so the time together is productive. And if that takes a couple extra weeks, then, then that's fine. Right. So, and one of the things we might want to think about is, you know, do we meet in Gold Beach, which might be sort of, you know, then you don't have to pay for people to fly. We can, everybody could drive. That would be a little longer drive, I think, for the Yeah. Actually, I mean, it'll be California easier, Coast. I think, just to go to Sac Sacramento. Okay. Honestly. All right. Because there are so many of them if you really want to meet their staff. and Yeah. And, uh, and plus, that gives us a free facility to go to. Okay. Um, so that might be cheaper. Okay. Um, they, they have staff? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. Look at their yeah. website. Yeah. yeah. So that way, you could. What you could do is, if you had, it also gives you the opportunity if you want to have a staffer come in just for one short presentation yeah. on a topic. They could do that without everyone having to like. Yeah. Travel, good. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. It, it's pretty. I've flown to Sacramento once before. It's actually like one of the cheaper flights you can yeah. you can get to. Yeah. From it's Portland. Easy. It's like an hour and fifteen minutes. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's really generous of the Nature Conservancy. So yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So if we were thinking about something in July, 
Are there blocks of time when people are going to be on vacation and can't do it right now that you know of? And honestly, we could probably do a doodle poll. Okay. And just Why do it. Because yeah. I can get their calendar, too. Okay. And we could just start merging. And, All right. And, I, and, you, and if you don't have any outline deadline, like if you don't mind it's in September or whatever, no. then we have a lot of flexibility here. Yeah. When's our next schedule? We don't have one on okay. the schedule. We'll talk I about that today. Out the whole last two weeks of July. Okay. Oh, we can All do right. that on the doodle yeah. poll. Yeah. That's a big okay. chunk of July. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. I assume it's summer vacation, so I assume yeah, people are going to be gone for periods of time. Yeah. So, so just for our notes, it sounds like we have an offer to uh, get the Oregon Oost together with the Cal Oost. The Oost, Oregon Oost is, has an interest. You're going to f- communicate further directly with the Nature Conservancy on details. Can you keep <laughs> us in the loop? Yeah. I will get an answer with regards to travel, out-of-state travel restrictions. Um, and then de- definitely, though, if you if you if a number of you go down there and meet with them, then you know, we'll, we'll post it as you're meeting down right. in California with them. Right. So, uh, important thing in terms of asking them the question about the uh, restrictions on out of state travel is there would be no state cost. So that's because I think that's the idea is yeah. to save budget money. So in this case. I think it's just a matter of getting it's signed up by the directors also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Normally there's some sort of director DAS process, approval process if you want an exception. Yeah. The current um, prohibition is, or um, it's not an actual prohibition because it allows, uh, the, it, it just sends out of straight travel up to the director for approval as opposed to having a manager do it. Oh, so there's not a prohibition. There's an approval <clears throat> process and an extra it's approval process. process. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, of course, I would I would like to really understand the elected official rules. I mean, okay. I talked to <clears throat> talked to Senator Rubin about it. And he said he might just pay himself. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we'll, we'll yeah, see. yeah, I can I can check with uh, I can check with their staff and then kind of go from there. Yeah, I mean, they have travel budgets, then they can travel out of state, but. Yeah. Um, I just want her all to be up and up. That's all. Whatever oh, that yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. So they're not eligible for a, uh, their expenses being re- reimbursed uh, as non-voting members of the Oost because of their, their legislative status. But, right. Yeah, but I'll check with regards to... Okay. Uh, but that can be between TNC and the legislators, how they do that. Yeah. All right, that's it. Thank you for Thanks, Gina. Gina. Thanks. Okay, so... Um, do people need a break? Because Karin's here now. Well, we I need, need a break. break. One minute. Yeah. Break. Okay. So let's take a five minute break and come back and then. <laughs> and to pause, I just hit. And we're ready for Karin. I can never remember how to pause on this. He's using the record button again. All right, thanks for the, the long pause. So, Karen, before you go, several people joined us since we did introductions, and just so we have you on tape, if you weren't <laughs> here at the beginning, can you tell us who you are? Sure. Hi, I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I um, just moved to Oregon. I was the California Senior Fellow, and, <laughs> and um, just getting to know all the different ocean and coastal organizations. In the job market, so <laughs> you know of anything. We have money, we might be looking for an executive director. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, getting some help, trying to get some foundation, some other kind of things. So, um, yeah, and I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I'm the Senior Fellow at Oregon Oceanographic Society. Um, yeah, and I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I'm the Senior Fellow at Oregon Oceanographic Society. Yeah, and I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I'm the Senior Fellow at Oregon Oceanographic Society. Yeah, and I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I'm the Senior Fellow at Oregon Oceanographic Society. Yeah, and I'm Jocelyn Anna Bolson, and I'm the Senior Fellow at Oregon Oceanographic ODFW on Ocean Certification Hypoxia. Okay. Gina Carter, Nature Conservancy. Carter Brady, ODFW. Cool. Thank you. All right. On record. Thanks, Carter. Okay, thanks for the long pause. Uh, we're having a server reconfiguration yesterday and today, and I think everything just kind of went into pause mode. But um, I, I think I actually have the right presentation, and if not, I'll wing it. <laughs> Uh, and um, I, I'm happy to be here today with uh, an Oregon OAH monitoring group hat on, which is a new uh, community group of, of folks throughout Oregon who are interested in um, ocean acidification and improving the monitoring network that we have. 
uh, in Oregon. And so there's a lot of policy context, including the Ocean Science Trust here and in California. Um, and so I'm going to try and describe that whole uh, conglomeration of partners and efforts and the context for it. And uh, Louise has been joining us uh, in that group and has been a good connection between the Ocean Science Trust and what we're trying to do. So um, this is not a, a formal group. It is a come all to the table and let's do something together with the resources that we have and uh, leverage what we are doing individually to the greater good. So here's a smattering of logos of folks the Nature Conservancy, OSU, Sea Grants, the Ocean Science Trust, tribes, federal agencies, state agencies, nonprofits, it's all, all anybody who is interested in OAH related monitoring is welcome at the table. Um, so the real kind of common ground for why all of these diverse groups are interested in OAH relates to all of this stuff. It's natural resources uh, in the near shore and the impacts from OAH and thinking about what we can do to both understand what those changing ocean conditions are as well as protect the things that we care about. So um, it's not just OAH, but really thinking about OAH as a monitoring proxy for nearshore health, if you will. I really don't prefer that term, but ocean health, nearshore health, uh, and uh, understanding what's changing and, and if uh, there are opportunities to do something about that. So other common ground uh, for this group of diverse partners is that we see an opportunity to have a better monitoring network than we have currently. So this might be uh, the coast of Oregon and all the sites where we have monitoring sometime in the future. Uh, we don't have that now. So this is the after shot. Um, and really we want a monitoring network that can show the, the variation in ocean conditions, uh, the extremes both over time and over space. And again, um, what I mentioned about the, the impacts or the responses of the species that we care about um, to those changes. This is more similar to what we have now. This is the before. Uh, it's fairly limited. Uh, it is a monitoring network that's starting to show us some of these variations and extremes and trends over space and time but it is uh, very limited in scope and our ability to extrapolate between those spots on the coast is limited. And um, so there are lots of people interested in doing that and interested in kind of filling in some of those gaps. Uh, so one of the groups that I think I've talked to you guys about before um, that's very interested in this issue and in monitoring in particular is not Oregon, but the Pacific Coast Collaborative. And we, um, Oregon, are part of this governor's level um, association at the four jurisdictions from BC through California that are looking at um, uh, climate and energy issues broadly and ways that through non-regulatory mechanisms there can be collaboration and leveraging of efforts in those four jurisdictions. Uh, and as a part of the climate agenda in particular, this group is interested in ocean acidification and it's really in ocean acidification issues that the group has made the most or has made a lot of progress in the last several years. Uh, this, this agreement uh, among these jurisdictions started in 2008, so it's getting oh, it's almost 10 years that it's been uh, working. And, um, and OA is really kind of a centerpiece of the work that's been done. Uh, so Oregon, the Oregon Monitoring Group is, is part of this broader discussion and recognition that understanding the trends and making sure that the trends are rigorous enough, meaning that that monitoring network is, is strong enough to really inform the trends across this space. Is, is, a, is a joint um, goal and issue for this group. 
Um, the PCC has spent a lot of time um, communicating with the other coast in the U.S., uh, particularly to the Interagency Working Group on Ocean Acidification, which is led by NOAA, uh, and it has these uh, other federal agency partners. Um, and this group came into existence through the Congressional Forum Act, um, about the same time that the PCC formed in 2009. Um, this act was finalized, and, uh, and it, it uh, built the centerpiece of the ocean acidification program at NOAA and brought into existence this interagency working group and said thou shalt make plans and tell us what we need to do in order to understand and, and deal with ocean acidification. So uh, just to kind of reiterate, the PCC um, has been building this bridge between federal agencies uh, and the jurisdictional interests across the rest, West Coast. Uh, we also have um, stood up and supported the work of the West Coast Ocean Acidification and Hypoxia Science Panel, which you guys have cited in your reports. You've heard from Francis Chan directly. He was one of the panel members. Um, and uh, our current work for the PCC moving forward is building on this engagement with the feds engagement with the scientists across the West Coast and conducting a monitoring inventory. This, this is going to come back to the, the monitoring group essentially. So the, it's engaging um, scientists and, and managers across the West Coast to conduct an inventory, an inventory of what we are monitoring. Uh, the next stage after that will be a gaps analysis, understanding what is missing from that uh, monitoring network. And so these two pieces are really where we are uh, needing the support of this community that we're building in Oregon, the Oregon Monitoring Network or Monitoring Group. Um, the second piece of the PCC's work I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute, and that's... Um, looking globally to build coalition, and that relates to monitoring also, but it's, it's, less, um, it le it's less on point in terms of ocean tr science trust thinking and building a program um, and the, the real proximate need of the, the Oregon um, OAH monitoring group. So the monitoring group is built on the philosophy that uh, in order to collaborate, we need a community, right? So we're drawing from all of these federal, state, tribal, NGO partners to build a community. And uh, some of those community members have capacity in some way. They have funding, they have people, they have institutional framework, something to bring to the table. Um, others have uh, expertise, and that doesn't mean that the people who have capacity don't have expertise, but you know, the, the special thing that individuals bring to the table might be expertise, particularly I'm thinking about scientists who have built careers of, uh, uh, out of monitoring and understanding how to, how to monitor um, OA and other related issues. Policy people like me, expert in kind of the policy context and what opportunities are, are out there and how to connect um, these folks to that conversation. Um, and that together, through collaboration, we will get a, a, an emergent property, a synergistic benefit to all that we couldn't get individually. And the easiest way for me to think about this benefit is through funding opportunities, right? If we're all working together, then our joint common ground funding proposal has much more weight because we have an academic, we have a policy expert, we have somebody who's been in the field measuring the chemistry of OA, okay. and together we are much more powerful in terms of um, our messaging. So this is the philosophy. There is no organizational principle for this group. We are just of our own free will and interest and passion about this issue coming to the table together. And I'll come back to that um, in a second. So the group has been meeting since um, early last year, and the first meeting was, uh, was <coughs> organized by Lisa Phipps, 
who many or all of you may know. She's um, the head of the Tillamook Estuary Partnership. She's been involved with OWEB for years um, and is very passionate about OA monitoring. Um, and she pulled everybody together and said, we've, we've got to do a better job. What can we do? And so we all kind of came together. Simultaneously, this Pacific Coast Collaborative discussion was going on. Um, and I don't know, Lisa's persuasive, so somehow ODFW became the organizing principal around these meetings, and we've been carrying that water um, since then uh, with her very, um, very uh, pointed uh, involvement in that. Um, our next meeting, just as a flag, is coming up this month, the 21st of June. Everyone's welcome. What time? So we hope that you will be there. Uh, but anyone uh, in the room is welcome to join. What time, Carmen? One to three. One to three. The products that we have in process right now um, are a couple of things. Um, and I am going to pass around maps that um, some of you have seen before. Um, they're recycled, being reused from our last OPAC meeting. Um, and it relates to the inventory that we're doing. And so that, that inventory group that the PCC has stood up is producing maps of what we have. Um, and Daniel, son, who's right back there, who is a Sea Grant fellow, just to make some more connections. He's also in the job market. Um, <laughs> is, um, the genius behind pulling the Oregon portion of the inventory together into something that makes sense and that is useful for us to look at um, and try to um, think about how to set up a gaps analysis discussion. Now, you guys have done a, an inventory of projects in Oregon. This is uh, complementary, but not the you know not exactly the same kind of product. This was really focusing on the metrics that were being measured by the different research projects and trying to map those metrics simultaneously, um, as well as kind of build that community, which is how I see your inventory looking. Kind of looking at oh, what's the universe of of research and monitoring related to the near shore happening in Oregon. So this map of our inventory and what the status of our monitoring network looks like is going to be part of this framework document, this um, one of our first products from this, this group. Um, and it has a lot of narrative. It has some diagrams, a couple of which I'll show you in a minute. Um, it, it will have this um, map. We'll have a draft of that for the meeting on the 21st, an actual document we can hand people with all these people, with all these pieces. And we're seeing this framework document as really being that kind of group statement of, okay, this is our this is our goal, right? And we'll get some confirmation on the 21st, yes or no, how how it is complementary to that group goal or not. Um, but it also is going to provide information that we can copy and paste, modify, and put into grant proposals um, as we think about gaps, think about strategic investments we want to make in that, in that monitoring network. Um, so ultimately, that's kind of where this is going. And um, the next steps are likely going to be um, picking a pilot project and phasing in sites along the coast as we have opportunity and passion and funds to do it. Uh, most likely, we're going to talk about this on the 21st also, most likely the, the first pilot project will be in Tillamook because we have passionate Lisa Phipps there who it wants <laughs> to start that and kind of start this kind of kernel of interest and activity in Tillamook. Um, and you all are very familiar with the, the kernel of activity, interest, and knee tarts right next door because of the Whiskey Creek shellfish hatchery there. Um, and so that would be a nice compliment to have a couple of um, stations informing each other there in the All right, so um, I thought that, I mean, you guys are, are um, well informed and you've been thinking about connections between institutions the, time, the whole time that you've been here, but I thought I would just kind of 
lay out my thoughts about how all of these pieces are connected, um, it might help connect dots for you. Um, so I've described the PCC and the, the OA subcommittee in particular that's been working on this global work, trying to build global coalition, but more in, of interest specifically to Oregon is, is this monitoring inventory task force and inventory of, of OA-related metrics that we're building. And ODFW has been kind of the, the um, state representative to the OA subcommittee for the PCC, uh, has been the leader of um, kind of the policy message with that task force along with California. And we also have been doing the inventory work through Daniel's um, efforts and doing it on a state basis because that broad region is basically too big to attack with one you know, individual person doing that whole inventory. So what we have in hand is a state-based inventory that's been through ODFW. So I've described all of that. The monitoring group has been our sounding board. It's like, here's our inventory. How does that look? Is this right? Who else should we include? How does that fit into the vision of what we want to do here? Um, and then um, I wanted to introduce this kind of new concept uh, to you guys because it will intersect with you, which is that ultimately in the next year or two, we want to build an OAH action plan which will specifically lay out goals for the state related to OAH. And I want to just say again that from my perspective, OAH is a proxy for nearshore monitoring and research that, is, um, that, that pulls together our interests much more broadly than just can we measure aragonite saturation on the coast. Um, it's not narrow like that. It's much, much broader than that. Um, but the action plan really um, is uh, stems from this international side of the, the PCC House and the OA Alliance. Um, I want to. I want to hold. I'll just foreshadow a little bit more. I'll tell you about the OA Alliance a little bit more. Just go on faith. I'm going to want to do an action plan on OA in the state sometime soon, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And I see the Ocean Science Trust as being a big piece of this. I also see the other legislation that is pending right now on the OA um, Coordination Council as being a big piece of this, if it gets passed and comes to be. Um, so I, I am hopeful. I think that, that would be a, a very good device to have at our disposal. Um, I also see OSU as being a big part of um, building an action plan there, uh, like ODFW, very specifically um, part of the Coordination Council. Um, and the work that has happened and the thought that's happened with OPAC is also part of this. So it brings, kind of, brings all of these parties together, thinking about what we can do about this issue and how we can deal with not only OAH monitoring, but near shore monitoring, um, with the purpose of um, understanding OA. So now um, I've been foreshadowing about the OA Alliance, this global coalition. What does membership require? Building an OA action plan. <laughs> so the PCC came up with this device. Okay, we want to build global coalition, so what do we do? We build something called the OA Alliance. Well, what do you do if you're a member? You build an action plan, and you share your good ideas about what you're going to do about research, about uh, raising public awareness, about adapting to, about mitigating OA. Anything in there you can put in your action plan, and uh, and that's great. You know, you might have different capacity, different regional interests. That's fine. Just share your good ideas with everybody so everyone can benefit, and together we will be stronger than alone. So the actions that are within the scope, there are five broad goals in the call to action that are in these categories, and you will recognize that, you know, advanced scientific understanding, well, it's kind of broad, right? <laughs> I mean, you can, really, you can really fit a lot of um, goals into these five different categories, and it's meant to be inclusive, um, but it's also meant to highlight kind of some paths forward and some organizing principles about what actions might be. 
So that's why we're going to have an action plan. Um, we will build our action plan around those five goals. We may address one, we may address all of them, get to be seen. Um, we'll certainly be drawing from uh, the OAH inventory that the task force is conducting. We'll draw from the work, the report, and thinking that the OST has done, uh, and other Oregon work. And probably the, the initial kind of motivating factor um, will be specifics that um, we anticipate will come from a governor's letter saying, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, she's already committed to the OA Alliance and to developing an action plan, but it's unspecified what we're going to do. And, um, and the governor's office is thinking about how to move that ball forward in the next few months. Um, so, money. <laughs> so that all leads us to money. And uh, one of the other key um, uh, goals of the monitoring group, as I said, is to actually turn the framework into grant proposals, turn that into strategic investment and monitoring across the coast. And so where are we going to seek funds to do that? And we are open to any suggestions at this point. We are still in the process of building the language and the vision and, and the strategy behind it. And then once we have that um, agreed upon, we'll, we'll um, go from there. But Ocean Science Trust is definitely a piece of that. And we hope that uh, at some point um, the trust will have the capacity to invest in things like this. And we will have a roadmap for this part of your work and interest that will help inform what it is that you want to do. So I think um, that's it, except I wanted to highlight um, Andy, uh, Andy's work related to the West Coast Ocean Data Portal, because one of the really strong interests is that we share this information, whatever is relevant with anybody who wants it, and so providing access is key. And I'll let him talk about the Bren School project in just a second, if we still have time. Um, INR and the Oregon Explorer, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, is part of this. Um, NANUS is part of this, um, so indiscriminately trying to provide access to this information and, and share it with a broad audience is, is key. And that's all I have. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. Questions? Um, in addition, just because we're talking about OA and I have some extras of these, if you don't have this yet, I'd love to give you a copy. Ooh, I want one. Ooh, Emily, that's great. <laughs> I'm going to watch it tonight. It is available online as well. Is that the YouTube? It is. I watch. It's great. So, um, and I, I think just, you know, the other, the other take home is that I really appreciate you guys asked me to be part of your agenda and to talk about this, and um, hopefully it'll be a repeated event and I'll be able to provide updates. Or the next executive director of the Oregon Monitoring Group will come <laughs> um, and provide an update. So, so, Karen, what's your timing on having an action plan done? Good question. We hope that'll be maybe in the or in the governor's letter. We're we're talking right now about um, you know a reasonable time frame, be two years. Um, but it really it really depends on that direction and the direction that she wants to take it in terms of who does it. Um, if the uh, Senate Bill 1039 builds the Coordination Council. That might be a good fruit to, to help build that plan. Um, if not, I, you know, I don't know. Um, there isn't a time frame specified by the OA Alliance. Okay. So she's committed to the OA Alliance and to build a plan eventually. And um, I think there's a lot of interest in in um, having that be a typical Oregon bottom-up kind of public process. Okay, so you weren't here when we talked about it. So you know we have this $5,000 that we got from uh, Lincoln, Lincoln County. County. 
Yeah, which is being depleted by ten dollars each month now for the uh, service charge from the treasury. <laughs> so, <Save> me. No. <laughs> That's not on tape, is it? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I was just shocked. Uh, so anyway, you and I talked about a couple of things that we might use those funds for. One was potentially uh, pulling together the socioeconomic folks around what kinds of data we should be collecting in conjunction with the sites where we're collecting the physical, chemical, biological information. Uh, another was whether we, you know, add a site or add things we're monitoring at existing sites. And I don't know if you've given any further thought to that, but um, it sounds like we should spend this money sooner than rather than later and on something that's gonna sort of hit our priorities but also help advance what you're trying to do. So Yeah. And I I mean I, there's so many things to do with that little bit of money um, and trying to find the most effective place to put it, I'm sure, is what's foremost in your mind um, yeah. is in mine. And I wonder whether um, uh, thinking about the pilot project phased approach and if it's Tillamook Bay, putting that money towards that project, maybe around the socioeconomics of it, which of course are really uh, relevant for Tillamook Bay with the oyster industry and um, fishing industry, uh, as well as coastal tourism. Yes, yeah, so yes. timber, and I mean all of that stuff, right? So that could be a, a centerpiece for that. Yeah, well, potentially we, we should think about that, given that it came from the Lincoln County Economic <laughs> Development. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> what did they say? There the, no there's, no, there's, no, there's really no restrictions on it in terms of where we spend it. But I'm sensitive to the fact that it's right. coming from their economic yeah. development fund, which is supposed to right. help promote mm -hmm. economic development in their area, or at least. The, the other idea that um, that really comes to mind, and, and maybe we can talk with Bob Callan either before or at the 21st meeting, I, he hasn't been able to attend most of them, um, is talking about the Western Association of Marine Lab interest in, in citing um, monitoring stations at the marine labs. And although they had this kind of unified interest in doing it, their their funding proposal was rejected to do that. Yeah. And so it might be interesting to talk to him about doing uh, a marine lab, and it could be that that seed money might help establish some, at, we have marine labs, Charleston, Newport, Newport and Tillamook, I think that community college there may have, they have okay. a vessel that operates out of. Is this just for Oregon? Or is, is... Well, West, I mean, the PML, <coughs> Western Association Marine Labs is because why, but, um, but Bob would be, um, he's one of the representatives for WAML and is at OSU, as okay. you know, and he's so... The president. Hmm? He's the president. He's the president. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so that might be that might be a way to knit in kind of a very specific project. It would kind of hit a couple of places, mm -hmm. and uh, is, but we can talk about that more. Is anybody working on, or has been working on, or proposing to work on what kind of monitoring density we'd actually need along the coast to? Well, let's, let's talk, yeah, let's, um, I said I would give Andy a minute to talk about the Brun School projects, and maybe you can do that now because it relates to your question. Okay. Sure, so as a West Coast Ocean Data Management Portal co-chair, we submitted an application to the Brun School of the Environment, which is based out of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and they host competitions where uh, interested clients and propose project ideas, and then a team of students and a faculty member from the uh, program can basically select your project and say, okay, we would like the students to work on this. It's a real-world problem. 
we see it applying to marine management issues. And so we submitted a proposal to have the Brown students begin to think about the question of the co-location of protected areas and a water that's impacted by OAH. And so this team of students is beginning to think about the information resources that are being provided by the West Coast Monitoring Network. Uh, they would use the results of these the inventories that the PCC effort is, uh, has worked to generate and begin to take a look and see if we can begin to get at this question of co-location of waters that are at risk to OA or hypoxia or, um, and the, the existing network of our management sites. So the challenge there is understanding what information is available, um, how it spatially is uh, resolvable. So a lot of these regional ocean models are uh, done at the size of about a kilometer per pixel. And so the, whether or not that's good enough to begin to tell us that our management sites may or may not be impacted by uh, OA waters. And that's part of the question. And so this team is five students and their faculty are, uh, we are, as co-chairs, helping them reach out to the broader uh, community of people who are providing this information. And they will do the analysis and create a summary product. Um, one of the summary reports that we are asking them to do is to look at the monitoring inventories to, to begin thinking about the gaps uh, spatially, but then in conversation with others, you know, to get at this idea of co-location of impacted waters and protected areas, you, have, you need to use models. And so uh, beginning to think about how good these models are and what we can understand from them is part of the challenge. And so. Um, the team of students, which is starting their project, it's, a, it's about a year in time, so five students over the course of a year is a significant amount of capacity that can be brought to bear to begin to think about these types of questions. And so we're, we're hoping that uh, everything works out and that we as a community can get a benefit of the students helping us to begin to evaluate these questions as well as them using it for their master's project, and, um, beginning to think about data analysis using some of the models and other spatial data that may be available. So. And even though the project is specific to OA hotspots and, and <coughs> marine reserves for that portion of the project, the product has multiple mm -hmm. pieces to it, but for that piece of, of it, really the, the kind of outcome that, that Andy and I have talked about that's of interest is that resolution issue is can, it, can the project tell us that the resolution of data or the resolution of monitoring sites across the coast is not good enough to tell us what we want to know? Or is it good enough to tell us what we want to know? And um, can we say anything about um, how we should be investing in new sites as a result of their analysis? Um, and would that help us be more strategic in where we put money? Or yeah, Carl, can you back up to the funding slide that was towards the end there? This big long list. Yeah, that big long list. Because I think that's, it's interesting to me that um, I think this is really a key question for the trust, um, for us as members, to really see where do we fit in this continuum and what is the capacity that we bring to your big model of different capacities. Um, my, my sense of this is that the capacity the trust brings is to build capital for projects just like this. So rather than saying, we got a million dollars, come and apply to us ODF and W so that you can work with all of these other um, groups, I really see it as the trust can do the outreach to the federal entities, the state entities, the potential private partners, um, and other public sources to structure the funding in that sense. And so I just kind of want to throw that out to the other members for maybe some discussion or feedback on that. 
Can you describe that a little bit more? How it would be different from what she's saying as a funding source? You're saying that we would so we would if, more if the monitoring money? group um, said we need to raise uh, three hundred thousand dollars for this project. Let's apply to this foundation, this federal agency, and the Ocean Science Trust and put that together. I really see it as that them coming to us and saying, Trust, can you apply to these entities, build and house this um, fund that we and our other partners can draw from? I mean, it really kind of falls under the the rules that we just passed, um, not so much the competitive ramp pro program, but the RFQ, the RFQ, yeah, RFQ. RFQ where we say we have identified there's an activity happening that's in line with our goals that doesn't necessarily fit competitive grants, but we can we can structure this. I'm just trying to see the, the capacity that the trust has, and one of its purposes is to build capital for this exact kind of project. So I just want to And, and to encourage that. collaboration and in, interdisciplinary and interinstitutional uh, research and monitoring. So I think it fits perfectly in with what we're supposed to be doing and whether we have, whether we get money from the legislature yeah. or not, we still have a role to play as a convener and as somebody who could, could uh, on behalf of the entire state, apply for funds to get priority work right. done. We may not get the million dollars. Right. <laughs> we may get enough to get a director started even in a part-time capacity. And if so, how do we take our little $5,000 and start building as just a nub and start right. building, building, building that? Um, Karen, I don't know, do you have a response to that in terms, is that gel with how you view the trust, or is it, it, it is, um, and and I think that um, the the challenge is certainly how do you how, how do you pass that money through in a way that's uh, justified or defensible, and I I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that question, but it it um, I think that the trust could provide such a huge value add to this kind of thinking and process by doing that um, solicitation of, of foundations and uh, funding sources to get money. Um, and as you know, as we all know, there is this ongoing um, concern about using funding directly from foundations that may have a, an agenda that is seen as counter to the agenda of the Ocean Science Trust or counter to the agenda of the legislature or the policy of the governor and wanting to kind of make sure that that money that comes into the state and is funding research or funding monitoring is coming in with in complement to well, those that's goals, the right? Of the trust that we and outlined those priorities exactly. in advance of asking for the funding, and we we did that work right. last year. So, um, and so while you know the monitoring group, as I said, it doesn't have an organizing principle. It's just because everybody wants to do this together. We uh, can be successful, I'm sure, for seeking funds for some of these these projects. Um, I hope that we will be, um, but that same work could be located within the Ocean Science Trust, or part of that work could be located within the Ocean Science well, Trust. It's a campaign, instead. really, you know, to say it we is. want to build a five million dollar fund for this, or whatever it is, and that we take it on as a as a durational campaign of reaching yeah. out. But that's an ideal sense. Yeah. We don't have that staff or that capacity, but I'm just trying to think. Thinking of where this out might go. Ahead of what, what is the capacity that the trust brings? Because $5,000 isn't going to get it. Yeah. And we know that. Yeah. And we're not maybe going to be hard. in a position to have a million dollars initially from the state, but what can we do? Yeah. So, And I know that, you know, picking up on Gina's comments earlier about the California Ocean Science Trust, that they're in the same kind of position and could easily partner with uh, the Oregon Ocean Science Trust to seek regional funds. And so the power of the PCC kind of driving this inventory and driving the gaps analysis regionally is that 
there will be complementarity between Oregon's inventory and gaps, and California's inventory and gaps, Washington's inventory and gaps, that mm -hmm. could really provide a vision of how um, investment anywhere within that West Coast area could help really leverage our, our understanding. Mm -hmm. And the main difference in my recollection of the structure is that Oregon would act as a pass-through, um, whereas California might be more of a, they would be doing the work themselves because they have staff capacity to take on projects. And we, we don't really have that interest. We would want to pass that through to one of those many logos that yes. you have. Yes. Wasn't that impressive? Do you have a logo? You do need a logo. You know somebody who might help you build one. <laughs> right? I know a guy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to say if we are seeking funding outside, you know, of private foundations or other places, it would be great to have maybe a specific first project that we want. You know, if we don't get the million dollars, if there's like an opportunity that, you know, if there's something specific we want to go for, we could probably bring funding for it versus having our long list of priorities and this potential right. RFP yeah. process. Mm -hmm. yeah, no one wants something specific. That. specific yeah. yeah. Okay. As long as we're on the same page about that. Yeah. And you know, the, what I described of, you know, our, the whole state is too big to attack at once with no funds and no staff, right? So picking, picking a site and then kind of drawing some passion and some interest in solving one pilot project just makes sense in that, in that context. Um, it could be that uh, interest from the Ocean Science Trust develops another <coughs> kernel of thought. So if it's not, you know, maybe Tillamook is Lisa's pilot project, um, where might the trust want to work? And maybe maybe it's Newport. I mean, we have the NH line, of course, offshore, but we don't really have anything in the estuary. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's a pilot project that you guys could um, work on with um, HMSC, and which relates back to the Western Association of Marine Lab interest and so on. Yeah, and the other the other place that would be interesting, and this just because the programs at DSL and I'm familiar with it, is the work that South slu has been doing in Coos Bay, and the sort of disconnect between what's happening in Coos Bay as opposed to what's happening out in the ocean with regard to acidification, that they're going in the opposite directions and trying to really tease that issue out in terms of you know, so what why is that? Um, and not a permanent offshore site there. Yeah. I mean, near shore, but yes. offshore site, coastal yeah. site would be yeah. powerful. To sort of add to their network, because I think they now have nine uh, monitoring sites between South Sudan and the Coos Bay itself that where they're collecting data, and some of those go back 20 or 25 years, so there's a long data. Yeah, I think they're their dots are on there somewhere. Yeah, the, well, and, and this is filters to only show, you know, the right. high level of carbonate chemistry. Yes. Yeah. There is more monitoring happening that's at a yeah, different resolution. Right. And they've got the, they've been working with the tribe down there to add sites. And so there's there's a there's a rich data history. Inside there. the estuary is pretty rich. Yes. Data rich. Yes. But outside but we don't it's not. have the outside stuff. So it would be nice to get the outside stuff to connect. Okay, any other questions for current comments? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Very helpful. Thank you, yeah. Very helpful. Okay, um, I don't have anything else for today. Uh, do you want to talk about timing of next meeting date? We don't have to pick a particular date. We can do a doodle poll, but can I? But just something um, really briefly, yes. very briefly. Karen, I had talked with you informally before the meeting, but Karen had on her slides um, a couple of places, Center of Excellence through OSU and the Marine Studies Initiative. And I just mm -hmm. want to flag for people's awareness that Oregon State University is planning a Center of Excellence called Food from the Sea that's being led by 
Gil, Sylvia, Karen, Shelby, myself are sitting on a planning committee for a planning committee, which is great and so university-like. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So we're, um, we're helping to organize a workshop for the spring that could bring 50 to 100 thinkers um, to the table for coming up with some bold and innovative ideas um, that is going to mesh in with all of this stuff as well. So if you see that um, out there in the ocean realm, um, feel free to ask me any questions about that. I'm sure Shelby and Carmen are available for that as well. Great. Okay, so in terms of uh, timing for the next meeting, I would suggest sometime in the fall. We were late. before State of the Coast or after? Any preference there? Probably after. Um, it's the end of October, mm -hmm. last weekend in October. Full we'll practice meeting November 1st. If that factors into Okay. Right. Um, so I think about November or early December, somewhere in there. Okay. Uh, and I have a couple things for the agenda, and I'm open to other topics that people may want to raise. Um, one of the things that Shelby suggested is we um, have Shelby or somebody, Andy, somebody come in and talk about the Marine Reserve review process. Uh, since there was a meeting with staff about, so we're five years into a 10-year <coughs> timeline and there's a re whole review process that needs to take place around that, heading into the 10-year timeline about the effectiveness of those reserves. So having uh, somebody come in and talk to us about that process and where that's headed, I think would be useful. And then it also done me, it might be good to have somebody from NANUS actually come and talk to us about what they're doing um, and where they're where they think they're headed over the next five years, just so, and we can talk to them directly about our priorities as they're um, doing that. So those are two things that um, seems to me might be timely for us to to do. Are there other things that people want to? I would say um, I know that if. I don't think it's premature at that point, but it is right now as we're waiting for this legislative budget cycle to go through. But I'd like to have a um, conversation about our funding strategy and diversification of funding sources. Um, yeah, by then we're going to have a realistic idea of what we're dealing with. Right, and right. I think we have to be thinking outside of the, of the state budget box. So the right. sooner we do that, the better. Yeah. I think anything else people can think of that we need to do? I'm sure other things will come up between now and then. Mm -hmm. Certainly follow up from meeting with Thomas to Arizona. Yeah. <coughs> and you said OPAC's meeting in November 1? We also, uh, by then, we'll have some sense about where this other effort, this PSU-driven effort, is headed because they should be done or close to done with their product. So it might be time to actually bring them in and um, see what the website, web mm -hmm. portal looks like. And um, you know, it might be a good time to do that because it'll be after the State of the Coast meeting also. I tried to get a lease for this meeting and she just wasn't available. She had to do a review of some proposals for somebody today. So, Lisa, can I follow up uh, on Jim's question about the, the mm -hmm. Treasury's fees since we've talked about that? Yeah. I did talk to Fiscal and they said when they set it up, it is a flat fee. So whether you have a million dollars or $5,000, mm -hmm. it's a $10 a month service fee. Interesting. <laughs> 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 
deposited in bulk. <laughs> well, that, yeah, it's, I mean, it's not going to take a whole lot for them to manage. It's DSL who's got to manage the actual yeah. cash flow. It's not Treasury. They're just, you're just doing a balance transfer from one account to another from them. So, okay. And I assume that money's just sitting in a, a, an account earning 0.06% interest or something. Uh, I thought you might ask that. Yes, I think that's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, it's too bad it's not invested with the rest of the common school fund. We might actually make money. Well, Louise, if you come and talk to the land board in, in October, you okay. can talk directly to Treasurer Reed and yeah. <laughs> voice so, your concerns. So, so Chris and I talked about timing and uh, just reporting into the land board, and I suggested I do it at the October meeting since it'll be two years since we've been appointed and mm -hmm. can just provide them with an update on where we are and what we've been doing. And I, at some point, I have to do a report for the legislature. I can't remember if it's an even number year or odd number year. I think it's an even number year. We'll take a look. But. Okay. So we'll be coming up on for the first round of Potential reappointments or position vacancies. Well. No, so oh, some of you were appointed for just two years. I think I was just two years. Uh, to, to stagger the terms. Yeah. So Chris, good timing on that. Yeah. It's <laughs> work to do. Reappointments, assuming people want to be reappointed. Like I'd like things. to make that assumption. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, we should check in with everybody just to make sure that that's yeah. what they want to do. That can be a that can be yeah. a DSL task. Yeah. And okay. report back to you, Louise. Yeah. Good. I feel badly. I double booked. I have a, an appointment I need to reschedule for another year. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where to go. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else for the good of the order today? Great. Thanks, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you...